Thank you for watching the Tank Museum's YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe. If you can support the museum, please think of backing us on Patreon or joining one of our membership schemes. Or if you watch to the end of this video, you'll be able to see how you can help the museum by buying items from our online shop. Hello, my name's David Willey and I'm the curator here at the Tank Museum and this is going to be my top five tanks. Now many of you will have watched other versions of the top five tanks and what we really do with this is we give people the choice of whatever they see as the important tanks to them, whether that's because that's the first tank they made a model of, whether it's because there's uh, you know, a family connection, any reasons, that, that's what you can choose, your top five. And for me, one of the things that I'm very conscious of here at the museum, we talk a lot when we do things like tank chats, etc. We talk an awful lot about the vehicle, why it was made, some of the background. I often go on about the historical issues going on before that vehicle's made. But one element we don't talk enough about, I personally think, is that key element, the crew. Every vehicle you can see in our collection, every vehicle we talk about, that element that comes along with men, nowadays women as well, the training they get, the skills they can bring, their motivation, that's what makes a difference in battle when that vehicle has to be used. So what I'm going to be talking about with my top five tanks are vehicles that remind me of veterans I've met, I'm really going to be talking about, in this instance, five Second World War veterans and their stories relating to the vehicles and what it was like in a way for them and the impact that's had on my view of this amazing collection we have here at the Tank Museum. So let's have a look at the first of my top five. This tank is the British Light Mark 6B. And for me, this vehicle's got an association with Peter Vokes, who was a young Royal Tank Regiment officer who joined up just before the Second World War. He was a great uh, motorcycle enthusiast. And he goes out to France to fight in uh, that famous battle of the Battle of Arras, where the 4th and the 7th Royal Tank Regiment do a sweeping attack against the advancing column, which is mainly of the transport column, the bit they hit of the 7th uh, Panzer Regiment, Rommel at the front. Rommel comes back, sets up an improvised gun line, and both the 4th and 7th vehicles get heavily decimated. But the key element of that Arras attack, it has uh, puts the frights in the German high command, Hitler himself. He's worried about the fact that here we go again, is this another battle of the Marne? Um, like from the First World War that he remembers, is this something that's going to stop us? So he creates a pause for the German panzer divisions about 24 hours and that is vital in allowing the British Expeditionary Force to reinforce some of the channel ports and ultimately save the army at Dunkirk. Now, Peter Vokes was part of that and he has an interesting role in the battle because he's basically acting as a liaison semi-reconnaissance officer and at one point he's sent away from the main attack. He comes back only to see uh, the tanks littering the battlefield that he can't work out initially what's going on why aren't they manoeuvring what's uh, happening with some of these vehicles only then to realize most of them have been knocked out he reports in he's told basically to take his light 6b try and get back to the rallying point so off he heads towards Vimy uh, they pick up his driver at the time is someone called Corporal Robert Burroughs, but they pick up another, uh, a stranded major from Royal Tank Regiment um, called Fernie, and he jumps on the vehicle and they head off. But as darkness falls, they take a wrong turn. And this begins for them an odyssey that goes on from the 21st of May to the 1st of June, where they're basically, they get trapped behind German lines. Initially in their tank, they even join a German column at one point as they're heading westwards, basically. And uh, at one point, he actually ends up being waved forward by German soldiers. 
in the end, they have to abandon their light 6B and uh, Peter takes from the vehicle the compass and we've actually got that in our collection here. And they use that, the three of them, to carry on heading west, trying to get back to the Allied lines. Um, there's a series of adventures they go through. Um, they have to lay up, they hide a couple of nights. There's a point where Peter Volks ends up shooting a German officer at close range where they think they've been captured and they manage to get away still. And then they get to the Somme River. They are helped by a Belgian refugee. They find a potential place to cross. They have to hide up because the Germans are patrolling this point. The other side of the river, there's where the French army are. And on the 1st of June, at about 1.15 in the morning, they decide to try and swim across to get away so they can hopefully rejoin the Allied forces. Now, Robert Burroughs, the corporal, has been very solid in all of this. He's been, as uh, Peter Vokes says, an inspirational figure. And when they're about to swim, he basically says, look, I'm not a great swimmer. Peter tries to help him across as they swim the river. They're already tired, they're already exhausted, they haven't had much food for that period they've been on the run. And in the course of this night crossing, they get separated. Robert Burroughs, the driver, gets swept downstream and is drowned. Um, Stuart Fernie manages to get across, they're separated. Peter, with a compass, manages to get across and they finally reunite with the French troops and are sent back and ultimately Peter comes into Weymouth Harbour um, after trying to rejoin his unit which has now been evacuated. Now that story I mentioned because when Peter Vaux was down here and we were talking about these things, that idea of him feeling responsible for his driver as a young officer there and he said when he got back to Britain, one of the first things he tried to do, he had to report in, he was debriefed, he gives his account of what's happened, but then he went to see the Burroughs family uh, who were farmers down in Somerset. And he said to us that he saw a lot of fighting in the rest of the war, Peter, but he said that was the time he was the most frightened, was waiting outside the door where the family had assembled, they'd all sat around, to hear how basically Robert Burroughs had lost his life. And this is what he says where he went in to actually explain things. They were all looking at him. So he told the story from the beginning to the end and they all listened in complete silence. And when he'd finished, there was still silence. Then slowly the farmer shifted in his seat and he said, all right, lad, Everything was done that could be done. Don't blame yourself. And he says there, at that moment, the tension broke. He nearly broke down in tears. And I think that's one of those stories I tell when we come to here, when we're talking to the army, young NCOs, young officers. One of those things about that story is he felt he'd done everything he could, but had he really? And it was only when he got the blessing from the family that, look, I see you couldn't have done any more in that situation. So when we're saying that, I think on the whole, the army gets this because they do, they try everything with their training, with their preparations, everything before they go off and fight. My only question I would ask is do politicians and do we as civilians do the same? Have we really thought of everything before we send young men off to fight? And that's a story I associate Peter and this amazing light Mark 6B vehicle. This is the British A13, the cruiser tank from the early war period. And my association with this vehicle is with a gentleman called Ron Huggins, who was a long-term volunteer here at the Tank Museum. Now, Ron joined the 10th Hazards back in the 1930s, actually in 1936. And when he joined up, he was actually given a horse and a sabre. That's what he was going to go to war in. But very rapidly, the 10th Hussars was one of those cavalry units that ended up getting mechanised. And in 1940, after Dunkirk, the 10th Hussars are part of that British force that is sent out to try and help reinforce the French uh, with the 1st Armoured Division. 
and Ron sees service there, he's fighting in one of these A-13s and he loses some of his friends in A-13s in that fighting. Uh, in the end, he has to abandon his vehicle and he, with a, a number of other soldiers that are making their way to the coast, he ends up signalling uh, a British warship, they're using a, a lamp, and in the end a boat comes ashore, stays offshore uh, with a naval officer in, shouting to make sure before they come in that these are British soldiers, they're going to come in to rescue and it's not a German trap. Um, so Ron makes it back to Britain, um, he's promoted, ultimately he becomes a regimental sergeant major for the 10th Hussars, he sees action in North Africa, he's blown out a number of vehicles, um, he's actually there when the famous German general von Thoma is captured, uh, he then goes across, he sees a lot of action again, fighting his way up Italy. And uh, again, after the war, like so many of these people who've had that responsibility role uh, of a regimental sergeant major, he ends up going into social work, that idea of looking after people, making sure people are kept on the straight and narrow, etc. Now, when Ron's wife died in the 1980s, he came down to the tank museum and started volunteering here. And when I came here, there he was on a regular basis. Whenever we have an event, a half term, he'd lay out a table with all his kit on and he'd talk to people about it. And I know there'd be thousands of people out there with photographs or remember Ron when they were kids meeting him, etc. And uh, the interesting thing is you can never find a bad photograph of Ron. He's always smiling. He's always got this big grin on his face as he's talking to people. Now, Ron also, he uh, commanded our Sherman tank with another great veteran, Harry Webb, and that used to drive around the arena all the time. And I always remember other people who were in the tank at the time, they'd say, Ron really lived it. He'd be giving commands into a microphone, even if it wasn't attached to anything. He was back there. He really lived his events all the time. And uh, I think as time went on, that war service um, was, became more important to him. And, and he certainly wanted to share his experience with people. And that's why we had Ron here on one particular day where we had lots of different school groups in um, and we had different servicemen talking about their experiences from the guys serving today. Uh, we had some women who'd been in the land uh, army in the Second World War, all sorts of people there talking to youngsters. And I remember they were all sat round and Ron was talking about his World War II experiences, some very young kids there, the teachers, I was at the back, and a hand went up and the question was asked, did you ever kill a German? And I remember feeling that prickle that went round the teachers. Everything had gone really well up to now. Is that the sort of question we should be asking a veteran in that way? Completely unfazed, Ron comes back and he explains. He's in his A13, he's in France. He opens the hatch, he's looking forward. They are waiting for a German attack and he sees in a ditch crawling towards him a German soldier. And he said, I reached into the turret, I took out my service revolver, I leant out, I aimed, and I shot that German soldier. And you could hear the silence, as it were, of all these kids looking at him. And the kid who asked the question said, what did you think of that? And he said, at the time he said, I thought I'd done my job well, I'd aimed at his body mass. Shooting a pistol, by the way, is not the easy thing like Westerns. You know, the, I don't know if it was Ron who told me the story. He said, you know, it's hard to hit the, uh, the, the ocean from a dinghy. You know, aiming a pistol and shooting it well is a really hard art. So he said, I did my job. I thought I'd done it well. I'd aimed for his bo body mass. I'd done that as I was supposed to do. And he said, we went back after that day. He said, we leaguered up with the tanks. He put his blanket over his head and he said he cried like a baby because he realised there was some mother, some father who doesn't realise their son was already dead. And that moment you could see all the kids had taken in what he was saying and typical for Ron, not phased by any of it, but told these wonderful stories to people. So Ron Huggins, for me, the A13, what a gent of a guy, what wonderful way he shared his stories to many, many people. And I'm sure some of you watching this may remember coming along and seeing Ron um, and talking about his tank. This is the wartime German Panzer IV tank. And way back in August of 2000, I was lucky enough to 
meet and have a good chat with a German crew member of one of these vehicles. Now the chap's name, he was Joseph Schoenicke and he was known as Joe and he came down here with his family and we put him back in the tank. He told us a number of stories about what it was like inside a Panzer IV and uh, also we sat him down and did a proper in-depth interview with the volunteer who was doing those interviews back then, someone called Nancy Langmaid. Now, why I found this one particularly interesting, for me, I was relatively new here, hadn't met that many Germans in terms of World War II crew members, what was you going to expect? And when he told his story, it was an interesting one, um, he'd actually grown up as a Sudeten German, uh, which after the First World War, basically when Czechoslovakia is formed, the Sudetenland, with many Germans living there, becomes part of Czechoslovakia. So he did that as his background. He was quite happy to admit when the Germans invade, they were happy about this, um, the fact that they were now back to being Germans, etc. And uh, he also talked about his early life there, which was working on a farm, relatively poor, how he then joined the local rail service, so he learned about Morse code. And he was only a youngster when the war began. So when he was a teenager in about 1943, the SS came to where they were basically all helping out on a farm, gave a presentation, and he ended up thinking, this is for me. If he's going to join the forces, which he would have had to done in about a year's time, he would go with this SS unit. And this was the SS unit called the Viking Division. And that was made up with Flems, uh, Dutch, various other Belgians, Nordic race people who, and the idea was, you join us, you can help us defeat communism and Bolshevism out in the East. So he joins, he gets about three weeks training on a Panzer III. Um, they want him as well because he can do Morse code, so they think straight away he can become a Funker or radio operator. And he's sent out very quickly to the Eastern Front. And he says he arrives on the Eastern Front, um, goes, is allocated to a Panzer IV, it's dark. He literally goes in the tank in the dark, under fire, in action. Uh, he climbs through the front there. He doesn't actually get to meet the rest of the crew till the following morning. Now he's fighting out on the Eastern Front and he, he describes all this in the interview that we, get, we had with him. Um, really interesting details, uh, the weather conditions, the horror of the nature of the fighting. And he himself was actually caught in what was known as the Chikasi Pocket in uh, January, February of 1944, where a large force of Germans are surrounded by advancing Russian forces and there's a breakout, there's an attack coming from the other way. Now he loses, he describes losing his tank in that engagement and he has to fight as an infantryman. And uh, this little piece here, again, that fighting on the Eastern Front, this is from the interview we did where he's doing this defensive role there. We were only infantry and we could see for miles into the territory where the Russians were coming along and there were columns and columns of tanks and troops. At about 10 o'clock that night, the Russian infantry attacked. We were just in a few foxholes, so it didn't take very long for them to overrun us. A hand grenade exploded just a couple of feet away from me. I was in a foxhole with another soldier. I'd never met him or didn't know who he was, and he took the full brunt of the blast. It was dark. All I could hear was just the blood gushing out of him, and I could just hear him talking to his wife, and that was it. And he goes on and he describes other horrifying, the retreat, trying to get back to the West. And the interesting part of the story for me was he manages to actually surrender to Allied troops in the end, taken prisoner, he's prisoner in Belgium initially, in 46, he's actually sent over to Britain. And uh, he describes again the different lifestyle, how it was changing, and he worked on a farm. And realising, being he's a Sudeten German who'd fought in the SS, he knew that if he basically went back to the East, he'd probably be shot. So he ends up staying in Britain. He becomes a uh, postman up in Lancashire, marries a local girl, and that family he had came down with him on the day. And what I found interesting, when we put him back in the tank and he was telling these stories, his son was there, his uh, daughter-in-law, his wife, uh, grandchildren. And, and when we were talking, it was just really interesting because they came over and at one point I was able to talk to the son saying, you know, interesting hearing his stories, isn't it? I'm sure for you. And he said, yeah, he's never talked about them in the past. And being here, they came out. 
And the other way round as well, a bit later I said to Joe, um, what's it like being back and here with your family and talking about these things? And he said, I've never spoken about this before, they've never asked me. So it was that peculiar moment where the vehicle again was almost a catalyst of him being able to come up with his wartime stories and his family actually hearing it. And I think both of them for most of their lives had kind of avoided that issue, what he'd been doing during the war. And for me at the time, it was one of those revelationary moments of hearing the other side, listening to a wartime German veteran telling his stories about what it was like in fighting in a vehicle like this Panzer IV. This tank is the British Cromwell tank, uh, again another one of those cruiser tanks uh, that was used really in the second half of the war by the British forces. And for me, this tank's associated with a veteran I got to know very well, a chap called Reg Spittles. Now, Reg was 22 when he was put in command of a Cromwell, and he was a corporal, and he was considered the old man of the unit at 22. He was the second North Ants Yeomanry, second squadron, and they go out to France just after D-Day. And he talks about serving there, and what I found interesting about Reg, I actually bumped him for the first time. He used to come down here with another veteran called Mike Bush and they turn up every year for Tank Fest and I used to get to have a natter with them and it became a regular occurrence. They came down with their families and uh, I got to calling them. I can't remember why the, the old reprobates and they loved all this and we had a good old natter each time. And in fact, Matt, who's filming this today, took some lovely photographs of the two of them together when they were down here one time. Now, those two gents, uh, again, they, they shared a wealth of stories, but Reg in particular, he ended up going along to a local school where he became almost their adopted veterans. And as part of that, the stories he would sometimes tell me on the phone or when we were here, he wrote them up. And there was something about Reg, the way that he did it, that by design, accident, however you want to say it, they were perfect little gems of stories, the way he wrote them, because he was going to be telling them to school kids, they needed a beginning, a middle and the end, and his turn of phrase, the way he did it, just seemed to hit the spot beautifully. And I just want to read you one of these stories that he, I remember he told me, and later when I saw it written down, slight variations in, in from how he told it to me, but he was basically out in Normandy, and because he was the corporal at 22, the younger members of his crew, he was always trying to be very fatherly to them, making sure they didn't get into trouble. They did as they were told. They made sure that they never went too far away from the vehicle without their sidearm with them. So if you were taking a shovel off somewhere, you had your weapon with you as well, because again, you know, you weren't too sure all the time. Where were the front lines? Is there German snipers about the place? And he writes this absolutely lovely story where they're in a French farmyard, um, they've stopped up, they're in column, he sees some raspberry canes and he thinks, I'm going to go off and uh, get something. And this is how he writes it as he put it together to tell the school kids. Having told my driver not to move, I took a can inten intending to liberate a few of those raspberries and doing the thing that you do with your own strawberries, I ate my fill first before filling the can. Now at that sometime in your life, you have most likely had the feeling of doing something you ought not to be doing and then of the prickling at the back of your neck indicating danger. So suddenly my intuition of happily picking raspberries changed to a sudden feeling of danger, which in Normandy could be the prelude to sudden death. I was literally frozen to the spot, not being in a situation I could defend myself when suddenly the leaves in front of me parted and a face appeared. You can imagine my mind was racing, total turmoil, and a voice spoke. It turned out to be a young girl of about 16 years of age and obviously very well educated because in perfect English, she said, hello, Tommy. Almost speechless, I managed to say, I'm sorry, but they look so nice and ripe. And she replied, please take what you want. And then she said quietly, thank you for coming. And I just love that as a typical Reg Spittle story, the way he can 
tell it with such charm, such innocence. And at the same time, I come back to Reg because these were guys serving in these tanks. They were an army of liberation. For my number one, I want to choose this tank, the British conversion of the Sherman that makes it a firefly with that 17 pounder gun on. And for me, I associate this vehicle in particular with a veteran called Ken Tout. Now, Ken, you may have, some of you may have read one of his books. He was a fairly prolific author after the Second World War, talking through a number of the battles he fought in. And he wrote what I can only describe as one of the best accounts of what it's like fighting in a tank in World War II. It's just called Tank and it's uh, 40 hours in a tank in August of 1944. Now, Ken, we've interviewed here at the Tank Museum a number of times. Um, he's, a, he's a wonderful gentleman. And I really wanted to end with Ken on a much more perhaps optimistic note than some of the other stories I've been telling. Because even though Ken talks about the loss, um, the sacrifice and the cost of warfare, and uh, for Ken, it really influenced the rest of his life. He, he had a strong Christian faith. He still has that strong faith. But it was really interesting to see how, how he went on in his career, the good works he did throughout the rest of his life. And the fact he did a PhD, he gets an MBE for gerontology, looking after how do we keep older people active in life. Um, and he's still at it to this very day, um, which is why I wanted to sort of end with Ken as, as there as a banner figure because his war service, he, he goes out to Normandy, he's again another one of those members of the Northamptonshire Yeomanry, he explains very well not only just what it's like serving in a tank and how tactics, the use of things like the 17 pounder on a firefly, how they learnt to adapt meeting powerful German tanks. Ken's there, of course, at the battle where Joe Eakins knocked out three enemy tanks in a row. So those parts of his story, you know, he's very, very good at explaining. But he also says in one of the interviews, something again, what's it like being part of that unit? And I just want to read to you one of the lines he says here, um, which is before going off, when asked the question, you know, what's it feel like going off to war or going off to battle for the first time? And he says, in a sense, I suppose it was one word to use was exciting. Um, you have to remember that we were only grown up schoolboys. We, most of us, 19, 20 or 21 years of age. And to many of us, it was, we were people who couldn't afford to go on holidays overseas. So for many, this was the first time that they'd actually gone abroad. And he goes on to say here, um, we couldn't believe we'd arrived in such a place. So there was excitement all around, but there was also a tremendous sense of comradeship. It was like playing in a football team or a cricket team. It wasn't just the 11 of us or 15 of us, it was 500 of us. And that was the regiment. And we were all together, particularly in that way you have a regiment. So there was great excitement and great comradeship. Now, Ken's also very honest. He's, he, he says about the fighting. Um, he was also, and he goes on to talk about when he meets German soldiers, and especially with the Normandy fighting, what he discovered, the difference between what he would call the normal German soldier and fighting sometimes the SS. But here's his description here of uh, how, what it was when meeting prisoners of war. He says, one of my tasks on more than one occasion when I was a tank commander was to be the tank responsible for gathering together prisoners that were to be taken, um, so one talked to the prisoners. Some of them spoke English and French. And you began to realise that these people, many of them weren't zealots, they weren't Nazi fanatics, they were ordinary people who had been farmers or mechanics or bricklayers or whatever in Hamburg or Hanover, and here they were talking to us showing us pictures of their families having surrendered and of course the main part of the German army, the Wehrmacht, pretty much deployed according to the rules. Now Ken, I mentioned that because 
we were really fortunate to get some German veterans back here and Ken was one of our British veterans that we got to meet some members of Tiger Tanks from the Second World War who came when we opened our Tiger exhibition. Now, Ken, as I mentioned, he has a, 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 a long life in terms of his writing books, he serves the community, and he's still doing that to this day. As I'm making this film, we were talking to Ken a week or so back, and he's still there helping with his neighbours, his charming wife, Kai, keeping an eye on things during lockdown, making sure some of his pensioner neighbours have got their food orders coming in, he's part of the neighbourhood watch. He's still doing that service to this day. And it's great for us because we can talk to Ken. And I just want to really summarise that point. We've missed. None of us now can anymore talk to a First World War tank generation. Anyone who fought in tanks in World War I, they're all gone. The World War II generation, they're thinning out, but they're still there. So if you have that opportunity, introduce the kids to them, talk to them. If you can record what they're saying, listen to their stories, what a wonderful experience that is. And it's certainly been for me working here at the Tank Museum. And think as well, there's veterans post-World War II as well, all their stories that need to be listened to, understood, and hopefully captured as well. So that whatever our interest in the subject, whether you're a gamer, whether you're a model maker, whether you love the technical specifications, we know from the actual veteran who served in the vehicle, what it was like, not just our suppositions as we, as I've said before, sometimes we play with the subject, they did it for real. If you want to know more about the veteran's story, I can only recommend go to our online shop and have a look at some of the books we've got there. Some of them are their own memoirs, some of them are compilations, great stories of what it was like to fight in tanks in the Second World War. We have a fantastic selection of books, models, clothes and other gifts on the Tank Museum online shop. When you buy from our online shop, you are supporting the Tank Museum charity, and that means we can carry on caring for our collection and producing this content. If you have supported us already, thank you very much. Subscribe and do keep watching.